Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster, co creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award winning blog, and service organization helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Elaine and Diane are certified coaches with personal experience raising children with challenges such as ADHD, anxiety, and more, and extensive experience in guiding parents to raise their complex kids with confidence and calm. On the podcast, Elaine and Diane interview experts, bringing you cutting-edge information about your child's challenges, teach you real-life strategies to create lasting change, and demonstrate how coaching can guide you to parent your complex kids one conversation at a time. For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to another conversation in the Parenting with Impact podcast. I'm really excited to have this conversation today with Lisa Richer, because we were introduced by a mutual friend who said, you know, Elaine, she's up to something really interesting in the world that I think you're going to be interested in. And when we met, and I guess it was a year or so ago, I'm like, yeah, she's doing what we do. She's seeing a need and filling a need. And that's so important. And so we've been really excited to collaborate with each other and talk with each other and, and begin, hopefully, to work with each other in the future. So I'm very excited to introduce you all to Lisa Richer. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Me too. I'm so glad you're here. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do with families at Journey to Bloom and how you came to be doing this work. Yeah. So it came through the need of my own children. So my life often does. journey. Yes, right? absolutely. And recognizing also that so many of the differences I had growing up, in fact, some of my sons, both of my kids, service providers said, hey, you also have some of this going on. How did you <laughs> deal with it? Right. You know, so it was like these light bulb moments. So what I am doing is really helping others like me mm-hmm. make it easier to navigate the school system, the services that they may or may not know they need. And so I'm simplifying the neurodiverse learning journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for parents and educators and that term neurodiversity is so broad. Yeah. I, it's been a big one for me this week. So, so there are kind of two directions I want to go. I want to identify what is neurodiversity, but before we do, if I can take a second, something you said, you said parents like me or people like me. And I, I think what you mean is parents, right? Mm-hmm. Of what we call complex kids, neurodiverse kids. And we'll talk about that in a minute. There's something about the expectations on us as parents that we're supposed to know how to do this. And I have this memory of a mom saying to me once before my eldest kid was in first grade and they were talking about a special needs program. And I said, do I need that? And she said to me, well, if you need it, you'll know. Hmm. And at the time I did need it. I just didn't know. (laughs) Right. (sighs) So talk a little bit about like what it is to parent this neurodiverse learner. And then we can talk a little about neurodiversity itself. Sure. If I could address what you just said about, you didn't know, right. There's things, you know, there's things you don't know, and there's things you don't know, you don't know. Yes. And and that third one is really at the core of journey to bloom and, and all the services that I'm offering to parents, because without that clarity, you can't gain the confidence. And then you can't find the courage to really show up and do what, you know, in your gut, needs to happen for your child. And what your kids need from you, right? Yeah, exactly. Totally there. Totally there. Okay. So what's a neurodiverse learner? Yeah. So it's a great question. And I have spent the last year and a half digging in to it since you trying to define it. Yes. yes. (laughs) Since you and I spoke, because you asked me some really tough questions Um, And I I just want to share that because I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And when you said to me, you're onto something, I didn't really know exactly how much of something I was onto. I just Mm -hmm. knew that through my experiences with the neurodiverse kiddos, there was so many unknown facets. And in my research, my conversations with others like you that are in this world, but focused in maybe a different funnel or pillar, you know, 
I came to really recognize just how broad Mm -hmm. neurodiversity is. And it's still, I look at different visuals and there's some have some facets covered and some don't. So I'm going to give you what my understanding of it is. And I'm not a PhD and I, that's not my background. So I'm going to just tell you what I believe it is. It is an umbrella of non neurotypical learners. Mm -hmm. And it could be something that was triggered by even a traumatic brain injury. So you could become a non-neurotypical learner because something happens to you, but the majority of the neurodiverse learners go anywhere from on the autism spectrum, ADHD, dyslexia, uh, Tourette's falls under it, even someone that is left-handed, I have found out more recently, or colorblind. So, you know, it's a very broad, now some only need accommodations, but some need, you know, broader, but it's this whole facet, including anxiety and depression. I was just about to say, and anxiety and depression, right? And trauma. So you talked about a brain injury trauma, but also when we look at trauma informed support, trauma can cause challenges with the way that people process information Mm -hmm. in their brain and therefore how they learn. Right. Yes. Attachment issues. Right. So a lot of families with adoption, I also encounter dealing with some of these issues, whether the kids have other diagnoses or not. Absolutely. All of those things. And it's been really fascinating to me to inform, to educate and to help empower others that aren't aware of just how broad of the spectrum it is. And if we stick on the like anxiety and depression, oftentimes what's triggering it is one of those other diagnoses that we just talked about. And it's like the chicken or the egg. You don't know. And that happened with my younger one. We didn't know if the anxiety came first or the ADHD. We didn't know which one to treat. We think we treated the wrong one first, but then we figured it out. But they intertwine and we're not doctors. We don't have a license to figure this stuff out as parents. No, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I often say that, you know, in the realm of ADHD, for example, if you can't get yourself to do what the world expects you to do, and I think that's the same with dyslexia. If you can't figure out how to read the way all your peers are reading, it's going to make you anxious. Yeah. And over time, that's going to make you depressed if that's not addressed. Absolutely. And then with the autism spectrum, which my older one, which started my entire journey 15 years ago. Right. One of the biggest things still, he's a freshman in high school now is that social aspect. Mm -hmm. He had to learn how to socialize. He would throw rocks at kids and when he was three or seeing, because he didn't know. And we had a behavioralist that was working with us. We called him his shadow, but he was like a behavioral child. Well, he wasn't a behavior problem. He did not know how to communicate. He didn't know how to interact and engage. And still to this day, he says, mom, I don't really understand social cues. I don't know when someone's joking with me. And, you know, kids thought he was just strange when really he just did things differently and he's doing phenomenal. But when he was four, we told, we were told he'd never go to a normal school. Right. So when kids are not processing information, whether it's academic information, social information, interpersonal information, when they're not processing it typically in the same way as their, as their neurotypical peers, that qualifies them, if you will, as a neurodiverse learner. That's what I'm hearing, right? That's my belief. Yes. Okay. And what I'm hearing you saying is that when a parent identifies that their kid has a neurodiverse, when they have a neurodiverse kid, that there's something different that they need to understand in order to best support that kid through their life and school. And, and I'll tell you, my definition of complex kids is way simpler. Yours is much more well thought through. (laughs) Mine is kids who struggle with some aspects of life, learning, or both. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that's a great way to explain it because my way of explaining it and that breadth and depth is, is partly to educate, but it yes. also stresses people out because <laughs> there's so many facets to it, right? It, right. It is very complicated. And that's why when I say I want to help parents like me move yes. through this, I have been living this. I've been living it with these experts. And even as 
I came through to where we are today, if you and I, Elaine, hadn't had the conversation we did and you hadn't felt comfortable saying, you got to get clear, you're onto something, but do you really know what it is that you want to be doing and how you want to show up and, and collaborate and communicate? I wouldn't have been able to get through some of those phases mm-hmm. to become very clear that I'm a neurodiversity consultant. I'm not an advocate and I'm not a special education advocate. Th- those have bad stigmas. I am here to help any child that has a different way of learning. First of all, I really appreciate your acknowledgement of that. Thank you. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes in life, you know, we have conversations and we, you never know what the impact of that single conversation could be for somebody else's life and the cascade from there. So I really appreciate you sharing that with me. I'm really honored to be part of your journey. Thank you. The other thing that comes up for me around that is, how do I say this? When I was early on my journey, as you were, when you know, what I came to realize is that as a parent of really complex kids, I was expected to make all of these complicated decisions as their quote medical manager, but I didn't have the education or the training to do it. So I'm I'm interacting with all these psychologists and doctors and teachers, and I thought they knew more than I did. about what was going on with my kid. And sometimes they did and they were amazing. And sometimes they didn't. It was kind of expected of me to know that, but there was no place like what you're talking about. There was no way for me to learn that other than through a lot of school of hard knocks over a lot of years. And so what you're suggesting is that if we can, I think, if we can help parents early in the journey understand what it means to raise a neurodiverse kid, And that's kind of what we do from the coaching, social and emotional perspective and what you're doing from a from a more consulting perspective, which I love. Then those parents can can go out and advocate in a very different way and and can make those medical decisions in a very different way. That's kind of what I'm hearing. How does that land for you? Yeah, it lands and I'm writing because I don't retain stuff. I'm not writing it down. Right. So I can come back and she's taking notes. Y'all I'm like, she's my kind of person. (laughs) I'm always taking notes. And as I was listening to, I'm like, I'm not going to remember what she said if I don't write it down. So yes, helping the, I am a huge believer that the earlier you get the support and guidance that you need whether you think you know, or you just don't know, you don't know. And I, I went, you know, I'm going back to that phrase again, the better off you will be in helping yourself get to a calm place. So I'm not doing what you all do. And I love what you do. And I'm going to share this for a moment because that sanity school, when I like looked into it, I thought, wow, this is so much encompassing all of the ABA therapy. My older one had that's on the spectrum. Mm -hmm from a parent purview to help in the home. And I believe every parent should go through that training at some point before they're a parent, right? You need a license to drive. You should have some sort of training (laughs) to realize you're not crazy or it's not about you. So, you know, from a consulting point of view, even before I can help them understand, I help them get clarity that they're not alone. They're not the only one. And that they're not supposed to know what they don't know. And yeah. so, you know, surrounding myself with those village of what I called my, my dream team. I had an OT, I had a speech person, I had a psychologist, yep. we had a behavioral person. We had everybody that had something that I didn't have. And, and yes, it's helping to understand that an early, early stage. And this is really important, being willing to let go of those that aren't supporting you, even if it's for a short period of time. And some people might think I'm crazy to say that, but I had to stop engaging my family, not my marriage family. Your extended family, yeah. My mother-in-law just didn't understand. She didn't really ask questions, but my parents, I had to stop talking to them because they kept telling me it was just going to go away. Mm -hmm. And I knew from other people in my family that had sensory things I now know were sensory. I didn't know what they were before and and self-regulation issues that it wasn't just going to go away. They turn into adults and don't know how to cope with these things. And so I started seeking guidance from every expert I could find. And that's what helped me gain that clarity. Mm -hmm. And so once that clarity was there, then I can help the parents understand to what they need to do so they can be put at ease and Mm -hmm. show up and educate 
others, but they have to have that confidence first. They have to understand what tools and resources are there for them. Right. Well, it's, I mean, the t- it's so funny. The words you're coming with, the foundation for us are calm and confident. You keep talking about putting parents at ease so they can have the confidence to make the choices and do the advocacy they need. And just so you know, I'm going to put it in the show notes. I read an article years ago called Bless Her Heart, and it was about, you know, a family member who doesn't understand. Mm. And so I really want to acknowledge what you're saying. And for those of you listening is sometimes you have amazing support in your family. And sometimes you need to know what to listen to and what not to listen to, because your instincts and trusting yourself and what you understand about your kid is so important. And sometimes when in those, especially in the early years, when you're kind of feeling lost and you just don't know, it's hard not to hear when a parent says, oh, don't worry about it. Right. Or you just need more discipline or you just need to. Right. When anybody's saying to you, you just need to and you've got a neurodiverse kid, they probably don't understand how complicated it is. Right. And a lot of that's what you're about is is helping parents understand. Yes, this is complicated. Yeah, 100 percent. And some of those people may not understand it now, but they may understand it later. And Mm -hmm. that's a really important distinction for me to share too, because my best friend of 45 years, when my oldest was in the process of getting diagnosed, even she said she had three kids that were older than mine, much older than mine. She um, had kids young and she said, I can help leave them with me. I'll fix them. Right. And, and I was like, like bawling, yes. like what is, yeah. you know, and, and so fast forward many years, 10, 12 years, she's now um, occupational therapy assistant. She had gone back to school in the, in the meantime, and as she was going through school, she reached out to me and she was like, oh my God, oh, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. I'm so sorry. It, Cause I stopped talking to her too. And she's my best friend, but not talking to her about other stuff. I just stopped talking to her about my kids. About the kids. Like, yeah. You do not understand what I'm going through. And that was it. She didn't understand right. what I was going through. So and now about- she's helped me. So what do you want parents of, of neurodiverse learners to understand better about their kids? I want them to understand they're not broken. Yes. I want them to understand that it's not the parent's fault, that they're different. And I want them to understand that they're not alone. There are people out there like myself that can help to bring that clarity and get them what they need to help their learner thrive. Mm. So when you and I first started talking, you were really focused on helping parents learn to advocate. Is that still a focus of yours? It is, but it is the outcome. It's not the journey. (laughs) It is the outcome, you know, and, and I'm obviously play on words a bit because journey to bloom is my business, but it's really about that journey. And when I'm able to give them those three facets, that clarity, that confidence, and the courage. And actually my offerings are, are surrounding those. And you'll see that if someone looks at my website, but it's really that confidence piece that I focus the most on because when they feel confident to ask any question that their gut is telling them needs to be asked and challenge in an objective, tactful manner, they then have the courage to give their child what they need. And the child learns to advocate for themselves because they see their parent doing it or their guardian in a way that is creating the change for them to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. It's so, and you guys can hear why we're so much in alignment, why I was so (laughs) excited to encourage Lisa to do this work. Let's talk a little bit about how, right? We do a lot of work around how, how do you cultivate confidence in a parent who doesn't understand yet? What's the depth and nuance of what's really going on with their kid? Yeah. Well, it starts with building that relationship with the parent. It Mm -hmm. starts with me being very vulnerable. In the last couple of years, I have recognized the more vulnerable that I am with my journey and where I came from and, and where I am the more people wanted to engage and hear more and open up. And when the tears start flowing, it's like, you know, it's that celebration of not that someone's crying, but that they truly trust me. And so 
I have to build that relationship first. And then doing that and sharing my experiences, it brings forth the ability for another to open their mind and their ears to really listening to understand that they're not broken. And I have to go back to that because they have to understand that that's the case. In order to help solve something, you have to be comfortably uncomfortable talking about it Mm -hmm. and working through it. Because if you're not open to receiving the resources and the recommendations and the support, nothing's going to change. It's just like in any relationship. Well, and if you're trying to fix it, then you're not, you may not be fixing the actual thing. Like, yes, what we talk about is that we don't want to start with solutions, right? The, and the irony of that's where you thought you were going to be was doing advocacy around, yes. right? Sc- getting school accommodations. And now, you know, that's kind of the last step, not the first step, because we don't want to start with solution. We want to start by understanding, not the problem, but just understanding the situation, the dynamic, the nuances, the neurology. And with that understanding, you can problem solve forward to address the challenges that come up. Exactly. Right. But without an understanding of it, it's really hard to, you know, you're going to end up throwing solutions, throwing spaghetti at the wall and not really knowing why it sticks. Exactly. That's and that's one of my favorite phrases. Right. It, it's about not only them understanding and being comfortable with me, but me understanding and being comfortable with them mm-hmm. and what it is that they need. And I will say I don't let everyone I don't take everyone in as a client. Because mm-hmm. if someone's not on the cusp of being ready or ready to actually have these tough conversations, the last thing I want to do is take someone's money when they're not ready mm-hmm. to lean in and do the hard, the hard work because there's so much shame and guilt oh, that gosh. bubbles up in parents. And I know I, mean, I went through it because with my older one, we got so far and with my younger one, it was so late in diagnoses that we really figured out what was going on and things keep popping up for him. He's a way more complex child than my older one. Mm -hmm. Now that we realize how many things he has going on, ADHD, anxiety, absence, seizures, visual pressing disorder, the list goes on. Yeah. And yet I couldn't help him until I got him on medication and on different things because all the ABA therapies, all these other services, it was chemical imbalance for some of his things. He couldn't, show up and participate until we fix that. Right. And I couldn't fix it with the tools and all the resources that I knew. So even though I knew a lot, you there was so much keep... I didn't know. Yeah. Well, and so that seems to be the theme. It's like, and we need to bring this conversation to a close, believe it or not. I told you it was going to go really yeah, fast. It go fast. So I want to come back to that, not knowing what you don't know kind of thing, but let's stop for a minute. How can people get in touch and find out more about Journey to Bloom? Absolutely. So um, my website is journey, the number two bloom.com. Okay. And if someone will have all that in the show notes and information for you. Yes. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and on Facebook. So with also a journey to bloom on Facebook. And so they can get in touch with me uh, through any of those facets. You can also email me at Lisa at journey to bloom.com. Great. It's pretty simple. Fabulous. And so let's wrap this conversation. This theme of we don't know what we don't know keeps coming up. So if if you'll let me kind of, as I ask you, is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? Is there something else that we haven't talked about that you want to add? Or does that feel like a good place for us to to kind of come back to and close? Yeah, I I think that the theme is is clear now and you did a nice simplifying some too of what I'm sharing. The only thing that I would say that we didn't really talk about is if someone's still, well, what does any of this mean? And how are you really going to help me? The one thing that I would want to share is what led me here is that there are places like Chad, there are places like your school system, there's autism society, there's all of these pillars of information. And there's the school systems now that are tossing everything but the kitchen sink at parents. And they can barely get through the emails they need to, let alone uncover 
where the things are that someone needs to understand or learn. And so that's really at the forefront of where I come in. It's anything from just figuring out who to talk to, who not to talk to, how to make it happen, all the way through that outcome if that's what they need. And so it really is that middle piece of it to help them help their children. Great, great, great. Anything else? I don't think so. It's a lot. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So one last question before we wrap, do you have a favorite motto or quote that you want to share with our audience? I do. And it's very much in alignment with this theme. It's trust your inner voice instead Mm -hmm. of the noise around you. Oh, I love that. It is so apt, isn't it? Trust your inner voice instead of the noise around you. So Lisa, thank you for, for being with me. And in this conversation, I mentioned to you earlier that neurodiversity has been my theme this week. One of my clients texts me every week and she says, so what's this week's theme? Because somehow like the universe, there's always a theme. Always. And the theme is very clearly neurodiversity this week. I was actually on a panel for the International Coach Federation this week on neurodiversity inclusion and coaching. That's so awesome. I'm just really excited to have this really important and powerful conversation. I appreciate your much more in-depth definition <laughs> of neurodiversity that I generally offer. And I'm going to go back and capture that and use it in some articles that I'm working on. But I really want to just acknowledge the importance of, of what you're doing and the work you're doing and, and, and where you're pointing your attention, because I think we're going to see neurodiversity inclusion is going to be a core competency in business and in coaching and in life in the future. And so, you know, from one to another, I'll tell you, it's tough to be a trailblazer. (laughs) So stay the course, keep swinging that, you know, that tool and know that, that you really are doing something important and it's a really powerful conversation to have. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Yeah. To those of you listening, thank you for checking in, tuning in, doing what you're doing, finding the courage and the clarity to be the parent that your kids need you to be, to be the professional your clients need you to be. Know that one step at a time, it makes a difference. Take care, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.